Okay, good to vach. Uh, this week, you know, there's this uh, tradition, Motzei Shabbos, from Lava Malka, to tell stories, Sipurit Tzadik, and particularly stories of the righteous people, of saintly people, particularly if the yard site is coming up in the coming week. In a way, uh, for the past two weeks, I missed out on some of the big yard sites, the, the Baruch Moshe, Shailu Kerstir, things. Uh, I posted some videos um, on Twitter for some of my older videos. That being said, uh, this week, on uh, today's the 7th of ER, th today, Mosei Shabbos, Sunday, we're coming on Wednesday night, Thursday is the 11th of ER. I won't be able to make it down to Queens for this yard site, but if anybody's in the area, I would suggest it's nice to go. Is the yard site of Yisrael Ber Kershid. Who was Rabbi Yisrael Ber Kershid? He passed away in 1852, if I'm not mistaken, before the Civil War. He was a student of uh, Nossen Adler. Nossen Adler was the Rebbe of the Chsam Seifer. So we're talking major, major things right here in America. So how did Yisrael bear a Talmud of the of, of the Chassam Sefer's Rebbe, of, of Reb Nossin Adler, the great Mekubo and the great Talmud Chochem of Nossin Adler, how did one of his students wind up in America in the 1800s? What I heard, and I heard that when he was still there in Germany by, uh, by uh, Reb Nossin Adler, Reb Nossin Adler would list the praises that he had for his various students. And he said, Rabbi Yisrael Ber is a chochem, that he's a, a, a sage, he's a wise man. That's how he would praise Rabbi uh, Yisrael Ber Hold on. Okay, Melly, the soup is boiling. Hold on. So, Rabbi Yisrael Ber Kershid, How did he come to America was the story. I mean, in those days, there wasn't much Yiddishkeit in America. And particularly, Tamil Chacham. There were other, what we would call, uh, uh, Jewish ministers. But, uh, and and they were Erlich they were, but they weren't really like Talmidei Chachamim. You had people who were pious Jews, who knew certain Malachas, Shacht and Mayalim, which takes certain skill and certain amount of knowledge. But you didn't have any people who were like real Talmudic scholars the way uh, Sreel Berkershit was. He was not the first Musmuch in America, although he was, I don't know, you could argue, it was Rabbi Avram Rice was the first rabbi in America, Orthodox rabbi in America, who was officially ordained as a rabbi, before that, generally, the Jewish clergy would have title reverend. And I've often suggested that maybe this title should be used more often in the Jewish world um, for non-rabbinical Jewish clergy. It used to be more common, particularly for Malam and Shochtim and, and Cantors. And, and I feel, you know, in this day and age, there should be, I've, and I've discussed this with Paiskim, I've written about it, um, there, there is a place for women to be Orthodox Jewish clergy, but not to be rabbis, but to be clergy, particularly to be chaplains, things like this. And I think a title like reverend would be appropriate. I'm really getting off subject. Really, the major point here is that the title really doesn't matter much, because, first of all, he basically, he was a rabbi. Even if he didn't technically, he wasn't technically ordained as a rabbi, uh, Strober Kershit was bigger than a lot of rabbis, uh, a, a greater scholar, and he was known to be a person of tremendous piety and integrity. Um, but it, this is a, a piece of American history, a, a, a Jewish American history, often overlooked. He's often overshadowed by another great early leader of American Jewry, was R R R Isaac Leeser, also. They both, both of them 
held the position in Richmond to be Hazan, in uh, to be the the minister, uh, the cantor. It's more than cantor to be the clergy leader at uh, Congregation Beth Shalom, which was the sixth Jewish congregation in America, and the oldest in Virginia. And that's why I personally kind of feel a certain connection to both of these great men uh, because I served as Rob in Richmond, Virginia. Um, they were different people. Uh, Isaac Leeser was much more of an American. Uh, very, I mean, they were both Americans, but I'm saying much more of a Yankee, you know, uh, and not as great of a scholar as a Bissell Bear. However, a man with tremendous energy and piety and knowledge and really one of the the great early leaders of American Jewry in a time when this was unheard of, you know, he he had a uh, periodical and so forth. But before, I, I think Bissell Bear was if I'm not mistaken, who I'm trying to remember the history. Who was there first? Was it Leeser or Kershid, who was first in Rich? Who was previously in Richmond first? Who was second? It wasn't that much time between them. Um, the Leeser he went on after he left Richmond. He moved to Philadelphia, and that's where he's buried. And uh, so Bear Kershid who, as I mentioned, is your site is this week. Fascinating story. So he came to America not planning to be a rabbi. He came to America wanting to go into business because he heard he could be successful in business in America. But he enjoyed Torah study, as, as and he was a pious Jew. And he had heard that in Boston there was a Jewish community, so he went to Boston and he met, there was, at the time, there was only one Jew there. This was in the early 1800s. It was before the War of 1812. Uh, so he packed up his bags, left Boston, went to New York City. He comes to New York City, and the Jewish community in New York was certainly bigger than Boston, not a tremendous community, but a solid, established community. Really, that's the oldest. A lot of people get make a mistake because the oldest synagogue that's still standing, the original building, or the oldest building, I don't think it's even the original building, um, in America, quite a lot of people know, is the, the Toro Synagogue in Rhode Island. However, that's not the oldest Jewish congregation in America. The oldest Jewish congregation in America is Sherith Israel, the Spanish and Portuguese congregation of New York City. Uh, and however, the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue is, you know, they moved, you know, several times in their history, and their location is not the original location. Um, the current location is not the original location. Excuse me. But that is the oldest congregation in America. So the very famous uh, uh, Hazan, essentially the rabbi, but didn't officially have a title rabbi, they would call him reverend, of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in colonial times, was Gershom Sheshus. Um, I, I've heard that there was a television show in the 1950s, I've seen other episodes of this show, but I haven't been able to find this one, where Vincent Price actually played with Gershom Sheshus in an episode of the show. If anyone, I, I remember asking Vincent Price's daughter about this. She, she, she didn't know about it. Um, but if anybody has a copy of that, I'd love to see it. The name of the show was Crossroads, I believe. And... Uh, I believe the name of the episode was The Rebel. It was a religious show that had, you know, it was, a, it was an anthology series with religious themes. 
that was on television in the 1950s, and there are a few episodes that are available in the public domain, and they're available on YouTube and so forth and other places. Um, but uh, Gershom Sheishis, as I said, he was the Chazan of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, and he was actually present at the inauguration of George Washington. They wanted to have a clergy representation there, so they, they had a Protestant minister, a Catholic priest, and a Jewish clergyman, essentially a rabbi, even though he might not have officially had this a title the rabbi. Of a joke. And the three of them were there at the inauguration of George Washington. Of course, at the time, the national capital was New York City, and so Washington, you know, this was a, 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 the, basically George Washington's rabbi. Um, uh, when he met, you know, uh, Sir Albert Kirsch, he came to America, well, he came to New York, for, uh, like I said, first he came to Boston, and then he came to New York. He was a bacher then, Sir Albert. He was still single, a bachelor, and uh, Gershom Sheshis was so impressed, you would think maybe he would be uh, a little overwhelmed to have s such a, you know, someone from such a... Uh, a Torah background, and, and, and someone, you know, here he is the, the religious leader of the community, and a young man comes who has more of a Torah background than he himself, the religious leader of the community, um, and yet he, he was not only impressed by him and welcoming of him, but it was a shidduch for his daughter that the Bresrael Bear married uh, Gershom Sheshis' daughter. Um, so that's, uh, you know, part of the history there. So, uh, uh Rusril Bear, again, he came to America not really necessarily looking for a shidduch, not looking for a steller as a, as a rub, but to be in business. Um, however, a Jew generally in those days, and many communities to t until today, was more successful in business, generally doing business with other Jews. Not always the case, but also he wanted to, at the very least, be located in a place where there was a Jewish community. That's why he left Boston. He couldn't get kosher food and so forth. New York, he could. At the time, believe it or not, Richmond, Virginia had a larger Jewish community than New York City, even though it was a newer Jewish community. As we mentioned, New York City was the first Jewish community in what's currently the United States. Um, Richmond was the sixth community, uh, and the establishment of the, the sixth congregation, there were Jews even in, in pre-colonial times, uh, in colonial times rather, in, in, in Richmond and in Virginia, but the community itself was established, I believe, in 1789 is when the congregation officially formed. So that was already under the constitutional government. It was a you know, much more solidified time in American history. That's when, when Washington was president already, uh, around that time. And... Um, but so as I said, uh, but the uh, Spanish and Portuguese congregation that goes back to the 1600s, uh, or maybe even earlier. I think maybe the late 1500s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so obviously the New York congregation, much much older than the Richmond congregation. At the time, like I said, the congregation in Richmond that was the sixth Jewish community. So we're talking around 1810 there about. 1811, 1812 is when Rabbi Israel Bear went down to Richmond to settle there. Um, so the community had been established for 20 years or so, and it had grown. Like I said, at the time, Richmond had a larger Jewish community in New York City, and that was the furthest west, westernmost Jewish community in America at the time, believe it or not. That's, that was the Wild West. Um, if you think about it, R Richmond, Virginia is a city that's not on the coast. It's not a coastal city. It's located on the James River, uh, so it's further west. And so that was really, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, was the first 
well, you, well, I guess uh, Philadelphia uh, is older. That is also not really a, a coastal city. It's on the Delaware River. Um, but uh, still, it's much closer to, to the ocean uh, than, than Richmond, which, which, as I said, is on the James River. Uh, so, Bisrael Bear, he, again, he wanted to be a soicher, he wanted to be in, in business, and so he and his new wife, the daughter of Gershom Sheshis, they got, moved down to Richmond. They traveled by stagecoach, this is an interesting story, and he sent his svarim, his, his very valuable collection of Judaica books, um, which you can imagine was a rare commodity in America at that time, particularly his library, which was most likely in those days in America totally unique, um, because there really probably wasn't anyone else in the whole continent who was able to understand these books that, that he had. Um, that was, like I said, he was, he and his wife traveled by stagecoach. They might have had a child by then, I'm not sure. Um, and the, his library went by ship. That was, I'm not sure if it was during or just before the War of 1812. So what happened was the ship that was, um, that had in its cargo this very valuable Judaica library, um, I don't know how extensive it was, but it was, however it was, it had it, been extremely rare and valuable at that time, particularly in America. Um, the ship got captured by the British. And so where Bussereau Bear could imagine what he felt losing this treasure trove of books the story goes that it made it down somewhere to the Caribbean, I believe, to Barbados, is where the ship wound up. And Israel Bear said some years later, the entire library was returned to him, nothing was missing. And, he's, and this, to me, is the most fascinating part of the story, and mind-boggling to me, because I don't know very many rabbis, although I've heard of some, uh, that we can, and I have some friends who, who meet this, who are along these lines, but uh, this is going to sound very strange to a lot of people. To me, it definitely sounds strange. He said he didn't know if it was his fellow Jew or his brother Mason. He was a Freemason. Um, like who, every Jew in Richmond. Yeah. Who? Uh, well, all who uh, who returned him his Judaica library. And because appa apparently within every one of his books he had his name stamped and some Masonic symbols stamped into the uh, into the books. And the, the interesting thing, my experience, and you know, I don't know in New York very many Jewish people who are Freemasons or who talk openly about it. In Richmond, Virginia, it was very common, but not like the very pious, religious, orthodox people, but a lot of synagogue-going Jews who maybe weren't Shomer Shabbos, things like that, but they were always going to synagogue. Uh, great many of them were Freemasons. I know part of the rules of being a Freemason is that you have to attend religious services on a regular basis. And I, I remember there were even... Uh, I knew at least one Gentile who was a Freemason who... Uh, would go to synagogue because he didn't feel comfortable going to church, but he, he enjoyed synagogue. At the time he was married to a Jewish woman, uh, he never converted, but he, uh, he, would, he would attend synagogue regularly. Didn't really come to my synagogue. He, he, but, All his people were there. Yeah. Um, but we were friendly with, with them as well. But, uh, but to hear about very orthodox people and rabbis like that, it's not something that I'm so familiar with, although, again, I've heard stories. There is a rabbi buried in Richmond, Virginia, Hirsch Geffen, whose brother was famous, was Rabbi Tobias Geffen, who was the one who, who gave the hechsher for Coca-Cola. And he, uh, so he was one of the few people who was privy to the secret formula of Coca-Cola. And uh, so 
he was a rabbi in Georgia, and so was Hirsch Geffen, was also a rabbi in Georgia, but then he relocated to Richmond, and he was a chaplain in the nursing home there, and on his tombstone there's all kinds of uh, Masonic insignia, and he was an Orthodox rabbi, a clean-shaven, but an Orthodox rabbi, and he uh, was a very high-level Mason, is what I heard. I, again, I don't know that much, but you know, the research that I did, so that it's kind of a strange thing to me. I know Rabbi Bart Sadok writes about the Kabbalistic roots of, of Freemasonry and things like that, and how it's essentially a, a Noahide movement, and things that, and that has, you know, very strong roots in the founding of the United States. George Washington, of course, many of the early founders were Masons. Um, <coughs> What else can we say about Rabbi Yisrael Bear? So he remained in Richmond for 11 years. So when he came to Richmond, again, like I said, he came there to go into business, but the community there saw a Torah scholar, and they offered him the position, which they gave him to be the Chazan, to be the religious leader of that congregation. It was called Kahal Kadosh Beth Shalom. Uh, also, it was a Sephardic congregation, a Spanish and Portuguese congregation, but they were comfortable enough to have an Ashkenazic rabbinical uh, leader, uh, pastor, however you want to refer to him. Um, Chazan is how, what they called him in the synagogue. That was his official title, was Chazan. Um, and again, like, um, you know, that was, like we said, the one of the oldest, the sixth the oldest congregation in America. He remained there for 11 years until his father-in-law passed away. When his father-in-law passed away, he was offered uh, the position as the Hazan at the Spanish and Portuguese Synagogue in New York, which he took, and he continued there to, as the Hazan there, although he also helped to found the first Ashkenazic community in New York, which I... What is the name of that... Uh, What's the name of the... I don't know. Uh, B'nai Yishurun, or... I, I, I don't remember the name of the of, of that, uh, but he was essentially the rabbinical leader of both congregations, and he is buried in the, the cemetery that belongs to the Spanish and Portuguese Synagogue, which is in Queens. It's along the interborough of the Jackie Robinson Parkway, not where the Rav Koilil is buried, and many other famous rabbis are buried in the, the cemetery that's pretty much the next exit over. This is a, a exit kind of closer into Queens, uh, further away from, it's, I mean, it's all in Queens, but further away from Brooklyn uh, is where that particular cemetery is. And like I said, I've, I've been there on a number of occasions um, and uh, it's if you're someone who enjoys visiting Kivri Tzadikim, it's certainly an interesting anomaly to have buried in America people travel to Europe to go to Kfarim of people who passed away in the later the 1860s, 1870s, and here is someone pre-Civil War buried in New York City. They said when he lived in Richmond, he would travel sometimes up to Monticello uh, to spend time with. Thomas Jefferson, this was of course after his presidency, Thomas Jefferson was not very fond of his time in the presidency, uh, but he was extremely fond of learning about different religions, and uh, he actually had a few volumes of the Talmud on his shelf, um, and uh, they would sit and, and discuss religious matters, um, so that's also a fascinating piece of history that, you know... <laughs> how uh, the Hassam Sofer is two degrees away from Thomas Jefferson. How, uh, you know, it's, uh, how the Hassam Sofer's rabbi was Rav Nassan Adler, and I don't know if they were together in yeshiva, so I don't know if it's a direct, but then <laughs> how Rav Nassan Adler had a Talmud, uh, Rav Ber Kershid, who was a, a well acquaintance of Thomas Jefferson. I think that's really a fascinating piece of history. Um, so, Zechus Egan Leno, they said, you know, all of his children were from back then in the 1850s, you can't imagine. I think many of his grandchildren also 
and they're also buried in that area. So can, you crazy. can't imagine what that was like to be Jewish at all, but to be Orthodox, to and be that pious time. in those days in America. It's really a, a tremendous, tremendous thing, and, and it's not to be discounted. And uh, I, I've and it's not anything said, we ever hear about. Yeah. No one talks about that time period in American yeah. history and in Jewish American history. Yeah. Nobody. Every, yeah, we you know we hear about you know the early nineteen hundreds and the Lower East Side. And we hear about the post war era. You don't really hear that much about the this the eighteen hundreds. So, it's. Uh, in the in the museum that we went to in Philadelphia, in the Museum of American Jewry, they yeah. talked about pioneer Jews a little bit. Yeah. But they didn't talk about from Kai. They right. didn't talk about what's it like to be Shomer Shabbos. Yeah. On yeah. the road. Yeah. You know, in a Conestoga wagon. Keeping kosher. And, keeping you know. kosher. Well, I, I don't think a lot wagon. of those people who went out west were able to hold on to very much. But if you lived in in a in New York City or Richmond, Virginia or Philadelphia, places mm -hmm. like that, where That's there easier. where there was a, a more of a community, then it was uh, you know Baltimore was another community like that. These were um, and and uh, Savannah, Georgia. But Savannah, Georgia very quickly became reform. Um, it was one of I don't the know, earliest. Just, no one talks about that time period in history. Yeah. You know, people talk about pre-war. Talk about like the 1900s. They talk about pre-war. They talk about post-war. But no one talks about the 1800s and what Yiddishkeit was like yeah. then. Like I said, America. there are some sources, but there, it's it's not as it's not as common to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. There's someone who writes in the Jewish press every now and then. Like I was talking about Isaac Leeser, who was also. And he wrote right. a whole magazine. I don't know if it was a monthly or a weekly periodical. About Isaac Leeser? No, Isaac Leeser oh, wrote, wrote, wrote a Jewish magazine, The Occident. And you can actually, mm -hmm. online, I think they have every article from The Occident available mm -hmm. online to read. And it's quite interesting to read, you know, what kind of, what were the hashkafas and things of Orthodox Jews mm -hmm. in America in that day. And, and how he was involved in Kirov, basically, you know, trying to push some Jewish ideology, although the interesting thing was, was like, I remember reading, uh, like a list of what does a pious Jew do, and it was like, frowning on things that people would consider to be superstitious, like Tashlich and Kaparos and things like that, it was like a Yeka writing, it wasn't Isaac Lisa writing, it was, it was like translated from German, and in Germany, you know, they don't have practices like that, and, right. uh, Tashlich, I'm surprised, I think in the earlier days they did, you know, in the, the times, I'm, I'm sure in the days of the Chavis Yor or the Shlau Kodesh, they, they had things like this. I can't imagine that they didn't, but, uh, uh, you know, but by that point in history, uh, the 1800s or so, you know, there was the more of the rationalist push in Germany, uh, you know, away from those other types of practices. I won't call them superstitious, but they were being labeled as, but still, they said, you know, the pious Jew keeps Shabbos kosher, this and that, you know, keeps the holidays, but he, he, they were mm. discouraging. I, I don't know if, if that was Isaac Leeser necessarily discouraging or just, you know, giving a platform for for different ideas, but the fact of the matter is, you, you see, there were arguments, talk about the Rabbi Kola, which much later, you know, in the 1890s and so forth, and there was, I remember reading an article, a Hasidic Rebbe, I forget which one, who came to New York at the time, and, uh, you know, the author, I don't know if he was Jewish or not, he's like, oh, this is like some kind of voodoo nonsense, and and then even they asked the Rabbi Koilo, and he said, yeah, the, the, these type of rabbis, these are charlatans, this is not serious Okay, but rabbis, that was like, you know, you know <laughs> Masnagdim versus Hasidim, yeah. right? Like... Yeah, but the thing is, the Vilner Gone was a big McCoupel, you know, but like, you know, things, uh, it's it's interesting, you know, uh, to see, but an, an interesting thing is the Chassidim all have tremendous respect for the Rav Akoyl. The Satmarov would say, tell people to go daven, but he, he didn't really push the Kivrei Tzadikim thing, but he said, you know, people should go daven by the Kev of the Rav Akoyl. I don't know if he knew about Rav Shobar Kershid. If he would have known, I'm sure he would have told people... A, a Talmud from a Nassim Adler here in America. I I I I wonder if Satmarov even was aware 
uh, that there was such a thing here in America, a Talmud of Nasanada, because the Chassam Seifer was a big deal to the Samarov. So, uh, it, it, on one hand, it, I'd be surprised that he didn't know about him, but on the other hand, uh, I, I never heard that he did. So, you would have thought that uh, it would have been something would have come across. So, all right, good to Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe.